All right. Well, it is good to be able to gather again this evening. Um, I want us to spend a few minutes in Bible study this evening. Um, in Psalm 33, I mentioned that this morning and uh, in our worship time. And, um, but before we do, let me just encourage you. I, I want to, uh, I want our church family to know that we are praying uh, continually for God to just keep everybody safe during this time. And we need to continue. I encourage you to to pray for one another that we would all be just covering one another in prayer because that's what we need that's what we need to do um, that God would bring us through this and uh, Lord willing I pray he brings us through it quickly because I cannot wait till our church family can get back together in the meantime I do encourage y'all uh, you know listen to the CDC and, and those that are giving us guidance, stay home if you can. Don't get out unless you really need to. Um, I think the more folks stay home or stay, even if you can't stay home, the more you social distance and are away from folks, the quicker uh, as a country we'll be able to get past this thing. But um, ultimately we pray and the Lord could, Lord could take it away just just like that, and that wouldn't that be wonderful? But um, anyway, let's be wise. I want to pray, and then we'll look into Psalm 33. So if you've got your Bible, uh, I encourage you to open it up. Uh, so let's pray. Father, I do thank you, Lord, for our church family. I pray for um, all those who will be watching this, God, and all of our church family, God, that you would watch over them, that you would put a hedge of protection around your people, God. Guard us from this virus um, and guard us spiritually, Lord. While many times when people are isolated from one another um, or when the routine is thrown off, sometimes in our fallenness, that's when we can really get into trouble. We, we don't, it's not good for us to be apart from one another, apart from our Sunday school classes and those who hold us accountable. Um, and Lord, I just pray, God, your spiritual protection over our church family, God, and we just pray your blessing on our community and our nation as well. Pray for our, spirit, our, um, our government leaders, God, that you would be... Um, be with them, help them to make wise decisions that preserve life. And, uh, and Lord, we just ask, we ask your blessing. We ask your blessing on our time as we direct our attention to you. And it's in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, Psalm 33, out of the many Psalms, um, and so many of them are, well, they're all wonderful, but of course, I have my favorites, and you probably do too. Psalm 33 is one of my favorites. It, it is a reminder that we can trust God and that we should praise Him because He is uh, he's trustworthy and He's praiseworthy. Um, you know, <clears throat> walking through or going through any kind of, of difficulty and doing it well is... Is kind of like um, driving a vehicle in the snow. So I know this year we didn't get any snow, but uh, you know many of you have driven in the snow. I enjoy it. I enjoy driving and in those conditions, even though it's best to stay home in that situation too. But um, you know, it occurs to me you could read a book on how to drive in the snow. You could. You could read blogs. You could even listen to somebody tell you how to drive in the snow. But it's only when you actually go out and drive in it that you can and have a little experience that you understand a little more about how, how to do it. Reading books. And it's like skiing. If you're skiing, water skiing, or snow skiing, reading a book about skiing is not going to help you much, but actually doing it will. 
Well, whether it's a snowstorm or whatever, storms come in life. And um, Psalm 33 is a psalm from the perspective of one who has gone through storms in the past. And therefore, there's experience here. And this, the psalmist knows that in that time, God is still trustworthy. And God's still worthy of praise. And so <clears throat> the first five verses is kind of the beginning, the introduction to this psalm. Let's read them. It says, Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous ones. We read these this morning. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous ones. Praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the lyre. Make music to him with a ten-string harp. Sing a new song to him and play skillfully on the strings with a joyful shout. For the word of the Lord is right and all his work is trustworthy. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the Lord's unfailing love. That's the beginning of the psalm. And from the beginning, we wouldn't necessarily realize that this person was in a hard situation but we see it at the very end of the psalm if you look in your bible down at verse 21 20 through 22 it says we wait for the lord he is our help and shield uh, for our hearts rejoice in him because we trust in his holy name may your faithful lord rest on us for we put our hope in you you can see that there at the end of the psalm that this is someone who is praising God, but he's in a situation where he needs the Lord's help. So there's some kind of difficulty or trial. Um, perhaps, uh, perhaps he is being pursued. David is being pursued by enemies here. It seems like that could be the case from some of the other things that are mentioned in the psalm. But he begins with praise, and I just want to say this before we look at the other sections of the psalm. One of the things that helps me when I'm going through any kind of difficulty or maybe even just a difficult day is to stop, and even if I don't feel like it, to praise the Lord. To play a song. In our day, we can tune in on anything on your phone, find that song, get on YouTube, whatever it is, something that really helps you, um, that speaks truths that are saturated from God's Word. But, but praise God. And in your car when nobody's listening, uh, if you ever see me out on the road, you might see me singing. Um, I, I do. I sing. So don't make fun of me because some of you do too. But uh, it does our souls really good, really good. It benefits our souls to praise the Lord, specifically in the midst of a difficult time. Because when we do so, we are reminded of who our God is. And that's important. So that's how the psalm begins, praising him for his faithful love, his covenant-keeping love, uh, praising him with a joyful shout. And then as we mentioned, as I saw, at the, as I read at the end of the psalm, it, it emphasizes his trustworthiness. But it says, um, verse 4, it says, the word of the Lord is right. And so as we think about this psalm, let's break it down this way. In verses, verses 6 through 9 focuses on the word of the Lord. Why? Well, let's read them. It says, The heavens were made by the word of the Lord. All the stars, by the breath of his mouth, you think of Genesis chapter 1, all God had to do was speak, and these things were. He created everything. They were made by the word of the Lord. He gathers the water of the sea into a heap. He puts the depths into storehouses. Let the whole earth fear the Lord, and let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him and then it says in verse 9 again for he spoke and it came into being he commanded and it came into existence we need to remember 
God's power in creation. He created by the word of his mouth. It's like that children's song that uh, maybe you learned as a child. It says, my God is so great, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. It says, the mountains are his, the rivers are his, the sky is his handiwork too. My God is so strong, so great, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. We need to be reminded of who our God is. He's the one who is powerful. And he, we see his power as the psalmist. He sees it in creation because God spoke and everything was. We worship the God who created everything by the word of his mouth. And he gives you life and breath each day. He gives me life and breath simply by his word. Um, it's amazing. Remember that God's powerful. Praise him for that. Now, you can think of that in other songs that we sing through the through uh, hymns of the church. Uh, you think of, you'll know this one. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hand hath made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And it says, my God, how great thou art. Look at creation and remind yourself of who God is and praise him for it. Now, power in and of itself is good, but this psalm has more to say about who God is. In verses 10 through 17, it emphasizes that God's in control. And right now, we need to be reminded, even in the midst of this strange circumstances that we're in with the coronavirus and all that, that God is powerful and that he is in control. And we see that in these verses. It says, the Lord frustrates the counsel of the nations. He thwarts the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. It means his plan can't be thwarted. I assure you, God is not in heaven wringing his hands right now over this coronavirus. He is not worried. He's not uh, taking anxiety medicine or anything like that. He's still on the throne. It says, happy, verse 12, happy is the nation whose God is the Lord the people he has chosen to be his own possession. Now let's time out on that verse. Oftentimes we take this verse a little bit out of context, and I know it's meant well, but we say this is talking about how we should be as the United States. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. And we say, well, you know, that's any nation, and that applies directly to us as an American nation. That's not exactly true, you know. In the Old Testament, God chose Israel. That was his nation. And that was a theocracy. There was not, in, in the nation of Israel, there wasn't, um, there wasn't to be multiple religions. People were not to have, uh, people were all to worship the Lord. And he ruled over the nation through prophets and then eventually through kings in the nation of Israel. Now, the New Testament does apply the promises that were given to the nation of Israel. It applies them to Jesus as the one who fulfilled the old covenant. And then through Jesus, those promises are enjoyed by all people that come to faith in Christ. And so in a sense, yes, we're part of God's nation, but not the American nation. The church is God's people. Um, and in, in 1 Peter, it refers to us, quoting from Exodus 19, refers to us as a royal priesthood, a holy nation. In the Old Testament, that was spoken specifically to the Jewish people. But Peter, in the New Testament, applies it to all believers, the church. We are God's people are his, his chosen nation, in a sense, through Christ, only through Christ. It's not that the church has replaced the nation of Israel. That's not what I'm saying. It's that Jesus came 
as the obedient one from Israel. And because of him, Gentiles, all of the world, gets to enjoy the blessing. But I, I took that tangent because I think it's important. But don't miss the main point of verses 10 through 17 is that God is in control. Nothing frustrates the counsel of his will. It will stand. His plans stand. It says he gazes on all the inhabitants of the earth from his holy dwelling. I'm in verse 15 now. He forms the hearts of them all. He considers all their works. And it says a king is not saved by a large, large army. A warrior will not be rescued by great strength. The horse is a false hope for safety. It provides no escape by its great power. But the Lord keeps his eyes on those who fear him. So he's in control. He frustrates the plans of the wicked. He, his plans are never frustrated in his strength. So he's praiseworthy and he's trustworthy right now because he's powerful, because he's in control. You know, even that, though, if you think, I was, I was thinking about some of the folks who have been very powerful and even had lots of control, and yet that wasn't a good thing. It's possible for power and control to exist and that still be a nightmare. Um, tyranny. Think of um, Hitler or Stalin or any of those who were um, coming from a humanistic, secularist point of view, but, but did such great evil, but they had so much power and so much control, and yet it was a bad thing. So we got to notice something in this psalm, that the psalmist doesn't just remember and praise God for his power and control. He praises God and trusts God because he knows that, yes, he's powerful, but he's loving that God is loving. It says in, let's see, verses 12, it talks about, as I mentioned, happy is the nation whose people he has chosen for his own possession. Oh, hold up. There we go. Meaning God has taken us, he's made us his people through Christ. And then it says in verse 18 and 19, the Lord keeps his eye on those who fear him, those who depend on his faithful love to rescue them from death and to keep them alive in famine. And so the psalmist praises God because God is a loving God. I mean, those who are overwhelmed by fear right now need to remember that God is powerful, that he is on his throne, he's not wringing his hands. And we need to remember that not only that, but he loves us. Now, he loves all people, but if you're a believer in Christ, he has a special love for you because the love that he has for Jesus, he has for you. And you have been adopted and made his child. He's powerful. He's in control. He's on his throne. And he loves you in Christ. And we can find peace in that. You know, I heard something this week uh, as, we, as we wind down. I know it's been 19 minutes now, so uh, I'm, I'm about done. But I heard this past week a friend of mine, Trey Black is his name, he pastors Lincoln Park Baptist in Knoxville. But um, I listened to one of his messages and he said something that really touched my heart. He, he said that he talked about how the world is always afraid of the what if. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if that happens? Always what if? What if the virus spreads? What if, what if a family member gets it? What if? What if? Um, what if my business goes down the tubes during this? The world suffers from a what if fear. But believers, we have an even if faith. 
what if versus even if. Instead of saying what if and, and being so fearful, we have a faith that because Jesus came and he died for us, which shows God's love for us in the clearest way possible that he suffered for us. But because he died for us and he rose again, we have a faith that can sustain us through whatever comes, even if I get sick. I'll praise him. Because Jesus rose from the grave and I know what my end will be because it's been guaranteed to me because, because of Jesus. Even if uh, I lose my business, even if a family member gets sick, even if our faith we have an even if, and it's because ultimately we know that God is powerful, he's in control, and he loves us. He is watching over our lives, no matter what may come, even if it comes, we can praise him. And so, because ultimately in the last day, his power will be, will be known, no matter what happens to any of us, all believers, by his power, by the power of his word, will be raised up. Just like he said, Lazarus, come forth one day. He won't say Lazarus. He'll just say, come forth. And all believers will raise up by the power of his word and be with him forever. We have an even if faith. He's praiseworthy. He's powerful. He's in control. And he loves us. I hope that's been a blessing to you. This psalm is such a blessing to me. God has used it many times to minister to my heart. But y'all have a blessed week. Stay safe. Stay at home if you can. Wash your hands, right? Um, and I look forward to seeing y'all uh, soon. God bless.